morning. Some of you think it's a good morning. <laughs> Alan, Alan's woken up. He's doing two jobs now, so you know, bear with him. It's great to be here again. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, the early church was hit by a number of problems. Um, same as our church, we're constantly hit by challenges and problems. And the problem of increasing numbers is one of their biggest challenges. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 6 this morning. Um, we've seen as we've been through, we're looking at, uh, we've been going through Acts, uh, our Believers in Action series. And um, I'm talking about, the, my, my title for this morning is called The Seven Servers Selected. Um, it's quite difficult to say this quickly. Anyone want to try it? No, don't turn. Seven servants selected. But we've seen the church persecuted. We've seen them beaten. We've seen them made fun of for what they preached. They've been challenged with corruption within the church and sin within the church. And then finally, the next problem that we're going to look at this morning, one of the most subtle schemes of the enemy. Doesn't tend to lose people's lives. Doesn't create bruises. Doesn't see people put out of the church. But yeah, it takes more of our time than anything else. Distraction. Distraction is the biggest robber of the church across the world. Stops us doing what we've been called to do. So we want to look at distraction this morning. It's a devil's scheme to stop the gospel being halted. N.T. Wright writes a story, he tells the story of being asked to write a book about Jesus at 60. Now we all know Jesus died when he was 33. So Jesus at 60, what would Jesus at 60 have looked like? And N.T. Wright was horrified. And he was like, well, what do you mean, Jesus at 60? Well, what if, the guy said, what if Jesus hadn't died and had lived till 60? What challenges would he have faced? And it was you know, we're saying, how would Jesus sort of challenged the administration of the church? How would he have delegated? How would he have um, sorted out the problems that were going on? How would he sorted things out? And N.T. Wright said, I'm not even going there. Because it's a big distraction. Jesus was focused on his mission. And we need to be focused on our mission Often uh, these are the things that middle-aged people tend to do. Organise, administrate. Ugh. The more children you have, you realise how much more difficult everything becomes. We had, uh, when we were going through, I, we were all very organised until we had our third child. Yes, I know. Well, we're not going there, are we? We stopped at three. Two seemed simple. We were right on top of everything. Everything was going swimmingly. We had the third one. He's a delightful little boy. Well, he's not so little anymore. But actually, everything got messed up. And when I was looking through about a few years back, I was trying to sort out some paperwork. And everything went back to this date. And I was March 2004, and I was thinking... What happened in March 2004? <laughs> what happened? And I, it's like, it took me a while to realise, actually, that's when Joshua was born. <laughs> and no administration had been done since. Because family life is a distraction often, isn't it? It messes things up. But actually, it's vital that we get it right. So this is, we're going to look at what the apostles did. And they tried to, deal with these problems they're not bad things it's not bad things administration it's good we need them we need organization that's why I've got Rick <laughs> although we did get the date wrong but we'll let him off on <laughs> he's changed it already 
But we have to keep the main thing the main thing. It's got to be our focus. It's very easy to get inward looking. We get distracted with our own needs and our own wants, the things that we think the church should do, the things that I need in my life for the church, from the church. And actually, we need to make sure we keep the focus on seeing the gospel spread and the kingdom advance. I'm easily distracted. I'm very easily distracted. I like to get rid of all the little jobs before I start the big job. Are you anyone else like this? You think, get rid of all the little things, tick some stuff off my list and then I can get to the big job. The problem is there are so many little jobs you never get to the main job that you're supposed to be doing. So I need some help. It helps to get the big rocks in first. I think for many of us that'll be a, a problem. We have these things in our pockets. The biggest distraction in the world. Everything is here. Everywhere you go, even on the loo. <laughs> it goes with you everywhere. It's a massive distraction. You can, you can send messages, you can read the news, you don't have to take the paper to the loo anymore. You can just take your phone. No one knows. You can play games. You can check up on social media. You can shop. How amazing is it? But it's a massive distraction. Massive distraction. So, my wife now removes my mobile phone from the office when I'm trying to study and prepare a sermon. And then I'm thinking, was that the phone? Did the phone ring? Okay, let's have a look at what the, pro- the, the apostles faced with their problems. So we're looking at Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. So it says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists. Now let me just explain what the Hellenists are. They're not going to hell, okay? And they're not Helen's favourites either. They're not like all worshipping Helen. Hellenists. Come on. It's the best you're getting this morning. It's about being Greek. The Greek-speaking Jews, the Hellenists, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should go at preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte from Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us through it. Thank you for the instructions that we receive. Lord, we pray you help us not to be distracted by the things that are going around us, but to focus on the things that you've called us to to be clear on what it is, Lord God, and, and to fulfill your purposes in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to look at this under three headings. Very simple, very easy to, to work out. We're going to look at the problems, we're going to look at the solutions, and we're going to look at the results. So that's three, just three things we're going to cover this morning. So we're going to start with the problems. And problems always take up most of the time. So there's a number of problems here. It's not just one, there's a number of problems. And some, some are good problems, some are more challenging. The two key ones that we're going to look, look at is the welfare of widows and the distraction for the apostles. So they're the two things we're going to look at mostly. But firstly, we see that the number of disciples 
was still growing. It's good, isn't it? So it's now in these days, disciples wrote, this is chapter six. So 3,000 added in, in chapter two and there's more added throughout, more things happen, more disciples have been added. So we're, we're looking at thousands of people coming to faith in Jerusalem, thousands. It's still growing. We get two things from the statement. The, the, the church hadn't decided on a capacity and stop reaching out. So they hadn't said, right, well, we've got to the full number that we can possibly deal with. We're going to stop now. And we're just going to settle and look after one another. The researchers decided they weren't going to do that. They were still reaching out. They were still making disciples. They weren't just making converts. They weren't just seeing people's hands up. It says they were making disciples. And that significance is, 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 is important. So that's what Jean brought in her uh, word that she had that, that things about we want to be disciples it's not enough just to believe even the devils believe it's not enough just to believe in God it's not enough just to believe that he rose from the dead you've got to want to follow him you've got to make him lord of your life a disciple is one who follows Christ he remains in Christ he bears fruit he glorifies God Disciples don't just turn up on a Sunday morning. It's more than that. It's your whole life. It's more than just putting your hand up and saying yes. You've got to keep putting your hand up and keep saying yes. You've got to say, yes, I want to do it. Yes, I want to follow you. Yes, I want to obey Yes, I want to glorify you. Yes, I want you in my life. You've got to keep saying yes to God. Andrew Wilson says, the Christian life is not a pavement, but it's a path. And Jean mentioned this as well. The Christian life is not a pavement, it's a path. What's the difference between a pavement and a path? Well, the pavement's laid, isn't it? And we just walk on, it's easy. But a path, you have to keep walking the same direction to make a path. Those paths we see across fields, you know, I heard a story about a, a building that was built uh, at a school and they decided they wouldn't build any pavements around it at all. They'd build none. They waited to see where everyone walked before they would build the pavement. So they found where all the shortcuts were going to be, where across the grass they were going to walk and, and then they, they built the the pavements in there but that's what your Christian life it's a series a long series of walking over the same piece of ground we've got to keep doing the same things God calls us on it's no good just saying well I tried that once it didn't work that's not discipleship that's not saying yes to God that's not making God Lord of your life say well it didn't work first I'm not going to try again no you keep trying you keep doing the same things. repeat those things that's what it means to make God Lord of your life, you keep trying the same things. We'll look at discipleship in a, a later preach, but this is it's, it's about Jesus being Lord and it, you're, you belong to Him. That's what it means to be a Christian. You belong to Christ, you're His. The desire in the church that time was to reflect, not to reflect, but to represent Christ. They were there to do the works of Christ, to obey him. And that meant the church acting as a family. And that causes problems. Now we as a church, we, one of our values is that we want to be family. We would want to love one another. I want to be there for each other. Actually, that's really important, that sense of community in church life. Not just about coming to a building, not knowing anyone, going away again. You might as well just go and watch Bethel TV. And make the internet your church. Actually, it's about engagement with other people that's so important about family life. Now we get some helpful stuff. Don't, 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 don't hear what I'm not saying. I see these things are really helpful. Things like the, the Bethel and the stuff that's online that's good. But actually nothing replaces being together as family, standing with one another. And we heard you know, there's so many difficulties and issues. People who are bereaved, people who are ill, 
people who are struggling with different issues in their lives. We have to be together to stand together for those things to work. And this is what the church was seeking to do. They were seeking to stand together. Now, why is, why is the, the widow such a big issue? They didn't have anyone to fend for them. There was no social services. There was no pensions. They may have moved away from their families. They, were, they would become Christian. They were Jewish uh, Greek women that would become Christian. They may have moved from other areas to Jerusalem and then had no one to, to care for them. Let's read some of the stuff about widows. It says, um, the church were keen to share with the poor, weren't they? The people sold things and brought things to the apostles and the apostles shared it out. Well, it goes back to the Old Testament and, and God made some declarations about that. He says this in Deuteronomy 10, verse 18. God, he execu executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and he loves the sojourner. So sojourner is basically foreigners without land. Hallelujah. Or you might call them refugees in the, today's thing, but sojourner is an important word. Giving him food and clothing, love the sojourner. Therefore, you who were sojourners in the land of Egypt. So we could say foreigners there. I think the NIV translates as foreigners. But it's not, we, we might just think, well, the, the people who are living temporarily here are sojourners. It's not just someone who's living there. So it can be a, a, someone who's from a different country who's living here permanently. They've got land. They've got, they're able to fend for themselves. God will execute justice for those who can't fend for themselves. So if we're not looking after widows and orphans and the, and the refugee, actually, we're fighting against God because God says he will execute justice. He will see those things come to thing. I had a funny story. I'll just tell you, um, my wife says I'm a sucker for a salesman. Um, but actually, she was away last weekend and, uh, and I was home. We had a knock on the door and, um, and there was a guy from shelter there we just I'd, I'd been sitting with Abby and, and, Nick, and, and Josh we were eating it's Friday night pizza um, <laughs> and they, they, this, this door knock had disturbed me and I opened the door and I, you, know, you know when you do it and you think I really don't want to talk to you and I opened the door sort of part way looked down like that <laughs> mm. he had a woolly hat on with shelter on and he looked like a really nice guy and I, you know I'm not rude person I didn't just shut the door I did engage him, but I did start off with saying, I'm not going to give you any money. <laughs> what a gracious man I am. So I started, that was my, my opening gambit. I said, but tell me about shelter. I used to support shelter. So then I softened then. I got all my pastoral heart came out. So I talked to this guy anyway. We were talking along. And I said, look, we give a lot of, uh, we give a lot of money away uh, and, uh, and to other charities. And I, I work for a charity and so is my wife. He said, oh, what sort of charity do you work for? I was like, there we go. I said, well, actually, I work for a church. He said, oh, I saw the four-point sticker in the back of your car, and I thought, mm, good job of engaging with this conversation. And he said, because that's, that's from our church. I said, oh, really? He said, yes, I go to Frontline. I was like, wow, amazing, young, look, look, young lad. Um, anyway, so we talked a little bit about da Captain Dave Sharples who came up with the four points and I chatted through with that and we chatted through about shelter and what he was doing. He worked for shelter and in Liverpool and, and he was going to move to Toxteth. He's engaged. He's going to move to Toxteth with his wife. So we chatted. Lovely conversation. I missed the whole end of the film that the kids were watching. <laughs> but anyway, so I didn't think. But I'd already decided I wasn't giving this guy any money. So we went away. Very happy. I shut the front door and walked in. I thought... And God said to me, you should have given to that. Said, okay. I said, Sam, that's the dog. Let's go for a walk. And he was like, okay. Let's go for a walk. So we walked out with the dog. We walked, I said, well, let's go and find him. And we'll, we'll go and sign up and, and give them someone. Just a little bit, a month. But, you know, we'll do it for a year and be fine. I get, go outside. No sign of this guy anywhere. No red hats. There was, a, there was at least two of them or three. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe it's not God. Maybe it's just my pizza. <laughs> so, but I went looking. I walked down the road with the way they'd gone. I walked around the corner, couldn't see them. Looked everywhere, couldn't see them anywhere. I thought, oh, okay. 
So I, I had prayed down and said, look, Lord, if this is something you want me to do, shelter. And I was thinking, because I'd been looking at this stuff about uh, refugees and, and you know, people who are homeless. And this was very much on my heart when I, was, when I was thinking. So I thought, oh, no, okay. So I thought, well, okay, it's obviously not God's will. So I walked towards the station, couldn't see them anywhere. So I started walking home, walking back the normal way I'd walk. thought, well, they won't be down here. And then as I was walking down the road, it was, I think it was Warren Drive, right down the end, these four guys are walking towards me. And my eyesight's not brilliant. And, uh, and, I, and they didn't have their red bobble hats on anymore or their sh- red shelter jackets, so they weren't obvious. So I walked along and then I realised it was this guy and his friends. So I said, oh, I'm glad I've seen you. I really felt that like God had said, I need to, to sign up and give you some, some money for the, for the... And he said, it's great. He said, I've just been telling these guys all about meeting you and how lovely it was to meet a pastor and he opened and he was chatting with me and now you've come and given us money. And these guys, it was brimming. And I thought, it was such, it's had such an impact upon me because I thought, my wife said, I knew that would be the end of the story. <laughs> but she's doing crash. So, but actually it's that, that compassion. It should be in our hearts. We want to help those who actually we feel like we can help. We've got a lot. We can give it away. We can help in other circumstances. We can help other people. And actually, those who haven't got any way of helping themselves, we should be helping. But these, these, these people that were complaining, they were a minority group. They were, there wasn't many of them. That's what we can assume from the passage. There wasn't many of them. They spoke Greek. They probably, their culture was probably a bit more... Greek than it was um, uh, Hebraic they were, they, the, the Hebrew Jews mostly spelled Arabic they wouldn't have spoke Greek or much Greek so actually they were really quite focused on this so they, they might have been pushed a little bit aside I don't think it was ignored they weren't being neglected in the sense of deliberately I think it was just their social administration wasn't great now as a church we can st- I can stand up and say oh, our social administration isn't great we'd love to care for everyone We'd love to give everyone the same, but we can't. It's difficult to do. We'll try. We'll do our very best to serve everyone, but it's very difficult. There's lots of pressures, and as the church grows and increases, actually those, those, those pressures become greater. So please hear, hear our heart. Our heart is to serve, but actually we need to keep focused on preaching the word. We need to keep focused on spreading the gospel, getting out on the streets, preaching to other folk. But we don't want to miss out on these minorities. We want to look after them. We want to look. If you feel like you're in a minority here, I say we want to care for you. But don't complain. <laughs> Just tell us. Because grumbling is not good for the church. What's, what does the Bible say about grumbling? It says, if I can find it, I think it's Philippians. No, I can't find it. No, what do I do with that then? It basically says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. I think it's Philippians. Someone. Thank you very much. I haven't written it it down. So as church, we, we mustn't grumble when we don't feel like we're being served. Actually, but do raise the issues. Do talk to other people. Do get involved with other people, get involved. Now the people, they, well, we'll come on to the solution, but they, they, they point Greeks who are going to look after them. We're going to make sure that you're things. So we, we want to join people together who are like each other, who will look out for one another. So we have home groups, our, our home groups, our small groups that join smaller groups of people together so they can care for one another, so that you're not missed out in those things because there is a daily distribution there's a daily distribution of the word there's a daily distribution of of, uh, time that people give we don't want you to miss out on those things Paul goes on later to say there's no Jew or Greek there is no slave nor free there's no male or female we're all one in Christ we want these things to separate to say well you know we could say "Well, uh, well it's all the families all the people with kids, they got all the attention in this church. And I haven't got kids, so I don't get any attention. That's a lie. 
There might be more people with kids. So it's just actually, it seems that way. That certainly isn't the intention. And we need to get better. As a church, we need to get better at administration. We need to get better at serving one another, having good structures to care for people. It was very easy when we were small. You know, we, we could look after everyone, very simply. I, I knew everyone's business, but for the last few years, that's not been possible. And as many of you, I don't know much about, but I still care for you. Now, you might have connections with other people in the church, but like Rick or Danielle or uh, Hazel, Lynn, different people who have who've made some connection with you, or the home group leaders like Mike and Helen and Andrew and Julie, made some connections. Michael and Nelica, I can't see them, they're not here. Everyone's on holiday today, what's going on? Is it Easter? It must be finished by now, mustn't it? Half term. The second problem is these things, although they're really important, can become a distraction for the name work. We could just settle down and say, okay, we've got a full number in the church now. We think we were aiming for about 100. We've got 100. All we're going to do now is look after these 100 people and make sure none of these sheep get lost. But actually, there's there's something in the Bible that says, no, you need to go for the next 100. Healthy things grow. To keep looking, yeah, we want it. We'll go after the one, the one's hurting. But actually, we need to see 10 more join. We need to see that. It's, it's important because actually, only things, if you leave things, they don't grow, they tend to de- deteriorate. If you paint your house, the first year you move in, you've got a fabulous house and you paint it all the first year, and then you do nothing else until you die. Actually, I tell you, it won't be a very nice house at the end. Most of the paint will be flaking off and everything. Actually, you've got to keep doing these things. You've got to keep working. You've got to keep growing stuff. It gardens. You plant lots of seed in your garden. It won't just grow up nicely with no weeds. Now you have to keep working at them, to keep tending those things. But what about widows? Should we just ignore them? No, widows are really important. We've got a number of widows with us. We've got people who are on their own. But it's really, it says in 1 Timothy that we should honour widows who are truly widows. So if that, and then it explains it, it said those who haven't got children or grandchildren who can look after them, those who haven't got people who are showing them, are helping them and serving them in their own household. But actually, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a necessary on us. Speak slow. Okay, I've got that. Speak slower. I can't speak slower. Because actually if we look after widows who are not being cared for, it pleases, it says, it pleases God. So we mustn't, we mustn't forget that. We'll say, well, actually, the apostles didn't. The apostles said, we need to preach the word and pray and the widows can just look after themselves. That's not what he said, not what they said, is it? James 1, 27, and I bet James was in this conversation. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep one unst- oneself unstained from the world. So widows and orphans are really important. We need to serve them. What are the solutions then? It would have been easy for the the apostles to say, that's okay, this is not working, we'll jump in and sort this out. We'll we'll do it, we'll serve the tables, it's no problem. I know it's easy because that's what I would have done. Because that that, that would have been in my heart. Well, we'll, we'll full time, we'll organise all the tables, make sure everyone's got fed every day. And actually, because we've got a load of people here and there's thousands, we mustn't lose any of them. Um, but we'll stop preaching the word and we'll make sure that, the, that everyone's getting what they need. And that would be a bad answer, wouldn't it? It would be a... Might, some people think, well, I deserve the apostles coming around to feed me. I've been in this church since it started. I was there on the day of Pentecost. But that's not how church should work. That's not how the apostles lined it up. But they came up with a solution that pleased everyone. Because they needed to not only look at that problem of feeding widows, they also needed to look at the problem of making sure they keep preaching the word. I've worked for 15 years for the church. 
my heart would be that all of you feel cared for. My heart that is that you wouldn't have to work to see the gospel spread, that you could just spread the gospel where you are. But the reality is that puts a lot of pressure on me to do things that perhaps I'm not called to do. Having a building creates its own, uh, own pressures. Things don't just tidy up or get fixed on their own. Bins don't empty by themselves. Dishes don't get washed. People have to serve in those ways. And people don't get fed. They're not all going to get fed by me. You wouldn't really want me to feed you. I can burn water. but they all have value. My, my, it's a, I find it, I find it, I've had the same philosophy, I'm being very, very open with you, very candid with you. Actually, I really struggle when the basic things aren't done. I really struggle to focus on doing the, maybe you think like, let's just say it simple, preparing my sermon if the dishes haven't been washed in the house. I really struggle with that. Why? It's, it's, it's a nonsense really, but I really struggle. I'd go and sort the dishes out before I'd go and read the Bible. My wife, although she's not here to defend herself, <laughs> she's much more focused. So she'll do the things she needs to do. Stuff the dishes. She'll, stuff it, I think. Just, just don't record this bit. I think, <laughs> I think, she thinks, it's all right, Dave will do it later. But actually, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't help, does it? It doesn't help you if I spend all my week washing dishes and tidying up and emptying. I love emptying bins. I really can't. It drives me mad when bins are overflowing. It's one of those things that's got me, bruh, drive me nuts. And litter, oh, litter. So if you see litter around the church, please pick it up because it'll save me a massive job. Dave, you do realise that it's on in there as well, Oh, she won't be listening, it's all right. But I love my wife. <laughs> She's the best wife in the whole world. Is that not going to, is that not enough? Not enough yet. Okay, I've got seven minutes. I better get a move on. So what did, the, what did the apostles do? They didn't throw themselves in and try and do that job. No, they said, let's appoint seven people. In fact, let's take a vote. Who do you think? They're not going to say, well, we'll just... We'll pick them out. As you said, well, who do you think? Who are the people who, you're, who are leading you? Who do you think can represent you? And then if we're happy with that, we'll lay hands on them, we'll pray for them, and we'll set them in that duty. Because that's important. That bit is important. It's important they lay hands on them and say, you're in authority in this bit. Because otherwise, people are keep coming back to the apostles saying, you know those seven men that you randomly picked? Well, they're not doing it. So I said, they give them authority. They take responsibility. They don't impose a solution upon them. They get the people to take responsibility. And I think that's lacking. It's lacking in the church that people take responsibility. They think, it's all right, someone else will do it. It's not my role. It's not my responsibility. Well, I say it is your responsibility to look out for other people. To look out and make sure people are cared for. Don't you think, well, that's Dave's job. Dave will ring them. Dave will go around and visit them. Dave will do what needs to be done. It's fine, it's fine. Or someone else, Rick will do it. Rick will sort that out. It's no problem. Or Arlo will come and tidy it up before the Sunday meeting. So I don't need to do it. I just leave it. Because I know someone else will take responsibility. No, you. You. And I, I'm pointing at myself. So you need to take responsibility. Take responsibility for how the church is. Take responsibility of how we communicate ourselves out there because you are the church. The church isn't me or the leadership of the church. It's you. We're all the church together. We represent Jesus in this place. And we want to do it well, don't we? Or do we want to do it averagely? Because I'm not happy with average. Are you happy with average? Or mm, could do better? Because that's often the marks that we get, could do better. I feel that myself, could do better. Actually, God doesn't say that over us, does he? God says, you're all amazing. Do you have his DNA? You have his blood. 
you have his heart, you have his spirit, you can do amazing things. We have many heads. I want you to take heart of those people. I want to encourage you about home groups where our, our vision, our prayer is that we have two new groups this year because we feel that's really important that people are connected within home group or we'll, we're looking at changing that name. But we have different small groups where we want people to be connected because actually it's really important that, you, that people have that connection. Not just on a Sunday, that through the week you've got that connection, someone looking out and you looking out for other people, that you take responsibility. You need to speak, you need to communicate with us as well as the other way around. So what sort of people did the apostles appoint? They appointed men of good repute, I'd say women as well. But here it's just the men, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We see that actually, this could be the star of deacons being appointed and servants in the church. We see this same word appear several times in the New Testament. Some of them referring to women as well as men. So I think you would say Romans, I think it's 16 verse 1, talks about Phoebe being a servant, being a deacon of the church. Being someone who serves, someone who ministers. I, I'm not the only one who ministers in this church I might have to describe myself as a minister of religion on, on application forms. But actually, we're all ministers. We're all called to minister. We're all called to serve. That's simply what it means, to serve. Leaders are here not to do all the work, but to equip people to do the work. And we've got some, and we, you know, I'm not, not complaining, we've got some, Amazing things going on in this church. People taking responsibility. Lunch, lunch club, you only have to think about, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about lunch club. Because it's, it's just that the, the, the ladies that come and uh, men and women sing off, many of them single, widows and, and uh, are coming, are people with, with needs who are coming and they're being fed on a weekly basis. But some of them, that might be the only company you have all week. Now, I'd want to see more, wouldn't you? So I just, Hazel does a great job heading up that team. I try and keep out of the way as much as possible because I don't want to get in the way of what they're doing. And Because I've got other things I need to focus on. I could do it. I'd, I've helped. I've helped serve tables. I've helped set things up. But actually, it's not good for me to be doing those things. And actually, there's other people who feel called to that. This is what John Stott says, all Christians without exception, without exception, get that out, being followers of him who came, he came, that is Jesus, came not to be served but to serve, or called to ministry, indeed give their life to ministry. God calls us all to ministry, but different ministries. We're gifted differently and we've got different things to do. Different callings on our life, different objectives for us to do. We are all in kingdom ministry full time. Eh? Often the description is, oh, you're full time for the church. No, you're all full time for the church. You can't go out from this building and turn your light off. Your light shines wherever you go. Sometimes that's positive, sometimes it can be negative. Think, I thought you were a Christian. This is really important. Actually, we go with God with us. We, we should work with kingdom principles. We want to see the kingdom advance. Why did we help with um, the whole passion for the Christ? Not to see our church grow, but to see the kingdom advance. To see the gospel out there. To see the message out there on the streets. That's what we want to see. And uh, all those people that took part, that's it. it's just kingdom advancing. But you can do that in your workplace. You can do that in your home. You can do that in the shops. You can do that, you know, if you're in, in, in education, in schools, if you're in, in the hospital. You can advance the gospel, advance the kingdom of God, whatever you are doing. But you have to think about it. You have to choose to do it. You get the good things in and the good things come out. What are the results if we... Do it all for the glory of God, because that's what Corinthians says. Whatever you do, 
do it all for the glory of God. I'm not doing it for the glory of you or for more wages or so that I'll get, you know, I'll give so I'll get some more back. That's not what we do it. We do it for God's glory. What are the results? The word of God increases. It grows. It spreads. The kingdom advances. The church grows. People's lives are changed. If we pay what God has called us to do, we don't get distracted by a million and one things. When we devote ourselves to our callings, God honours that. He honours it. Whatever it is. Now you might not always see the fruit. And you might not always see what you're doing. But God does. God sees everything you do. He sees every positive thing you do and you might think, well, no one's recognising me. No one's, uh, no one's asking me to speak at the front. Well, that might not be our calling. When the, we talk about the parable of the sower and the seed, the seed is spread on good soil. What happens when the seeds go into good soil? Because it really should be the parable of the good soil. It produces fruit, 30, 60, 100. If we're distracted, as thorns, the distractions of the world, that's what the parable says, the distractions of the world come and choke the seed and it's unfruitful. Don't let the distractions of the world, don't let the distractions of other people's ministries distract you from doing what God has called you to do. You have to think about Martha. I'm not going to talk much about her, but actually there's, there's a whole thing about being busy, being anxious for stuff. I'm busy and anxious, but actually not doing the thing that you should do. Mary, Jesus said to Mary, you, Mary's chose the better thing. She chose to be in my presence. Now that's got to be a, a fundamental part. And then Amanda, well, I'm feeding everyone. Isn't that important? Yes, it is important, but you're anxious about it. You're worried about it. Be at peace. Come out from a place of peace. Serve from a place of peace. Serve from a place of contentment, not a place of anxiety. I know. I feel it. The results are the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Not just converts, disciples. So talking about disciples. People following Christ, making him Lord. We want to see the kingdom advance. We want to see the church grow. And if we focus on the things that God has called us to, that's what will happen. This, this sort of section of, the, of Acts is really the end of the first part. And we move into, from the apostles into those who they appoint. And, and it comes out, and Paul's story. So we start to see, I think, Graham touched on it last week, about Stephen. So Stephen was an apostle. He was one of these guys that was appointed. He was appointed to serve table. And as he's preaching to the council, but he did what he was called to do. He stood up, he was full of the spirit and he obeyed. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna apply the things that God's called to you, called you to do? How are you gonna apply that in your life? Now there's wise men and women within our church who will help people to find the way. Because sometimes we, I don't know what to do. There's so many things. We need to be with each other to help each other. I'm going to ask the band to come and continue in worship. I just want to give an opportunity. Because you might feel that you're gifted. You might feel that you've got calling on your life, but have not opportunity. Or you might feel actually I've got lots of things but I don't feel like I'm full of the Spirit. We have opportunity to pray for the Spirit this morning. We all need more of the Holy Spirit. God's counsellor comes alongside us. It's great to have counsellors, isn't it? People alongside us. We're going to stand.